Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shlomo Stanmet, and I will be presenting today's webinar on advanced business rule management. Um, the title is, could be, is a little bit uh, inclusive, so I suppose the best way is uh, to begin. As usual, if uh, anybody has any questions, uh, please send them through the questions or chat, um, or uh, Alternatively, alternatively, you can ask them uh, during the quest the Q and A breaks that we'll have uh, in the middle of uh, the uh, during the presentation. Um, first of all, the first thing that we sh that uh, we should uh, give an idea of uh, what exactly is is uh, included in this uh, subject. There are three separate uh, separate uh, subtitles to this: uh, managing central business rules, creating uh, decision based workflows, and matrix based workflows. And before we get to the what each of them is, um, the first thing we should ask is why. What do you need these for? And just as a preview, I can say that each of these, uh, each of these uh, can benefit you, can benefit your organization um, using the, the advanced options that we cover over here. Depending on the, on the requirements and the scenario, one or all of them um, it could be applicable. Um, there seems to be a sound issue. Uh, I apologize, just uh, one second. No. Nope. All right, we can continue. Um, managing the central business rules is, first of all, about understanding the, the business rules, axioms behind what uh, each of them, the golden rules of uh, how to out it to, to, to do uh, business rule policy management. Um, and useful ideas. That'll be the first bit. The second and core of this presentation will be about uh, creating and refining decision-based workflows, and that will include a a, um, a code review, understand a a switch through a .NET code, and matrix-based workflows. We'll cover what they are and how to implement them. Um, the three subjects, although they might not sound like it, are interdependent. And we'll see exactly how uh, as we continue on uh, through the webinar. Um, this upcoming form is the theory behind uh, central business rule uh, policy management. It's a great read, and uh, you're more than welcome to go through all the details uh, and the in the online download that will follow this uh, the webinar. But the the short of it is, um, business rules are the engine. That, uh, that drives our, our work and our tasks and as such they have to be they we should uh, treat them accordingly they're important they need to be uh, they need to be treated as such um, you all know a single high level you know strategically based uh, business rule can affect your entire team or division or even company um, and so mod modifying them and editing them should on the one hand be, be simple because we want to be dynamic, we want to move, but it also has to be done very carefully. And lastly, policies will change. Constraints that we have, technical or other, will fall away and they will crop up. Laws, which uh, uh, implied in the regulation uh, business rules, are made by fickle politicians and, of course, uh, will always move around. What we want from our business rules are um, to display them clearly and transparently and make the, the management accessible to the, to the people that need to do the work, to the business users, to the business managers uh, that need to see them and modify them, uh, like we said before, dynamically. Um, first of all, the axioms uh, for the for business rules uh, are that we're assuming that our important ones can and should be shared across multiple workflows, workflows um, and uh, organization entities. And they're, like we said, they're volatile, they need to change, and we have to, uh, we're doing that to react to, to internal or external stimuli. If, we're, if we take time, if we're sluggish in changing our, our policies because it's technically difficult and you need the IT and you need everybody, then we're defeating ourselves. And so uh, this brings us to, to the first one, uh, to the first uh, demo uh, regarding the central business rule policy management.
Um, this is the stand workflow runtime. Um, and we're going to start with the master central business rule workflow. And this is, of course, a, a proof of concept that's meant to, to demonstrate uh, the ideas rather than something that's uh, read for, for publication. But the idea is, um, first of all, I need to classify my business rules. Understand which ones uh, are top level, which ones are uh, the highest, uh, highest access, and, and filter the access to it. Uh, through this tree. First of all, as a matter of permissions. If I'm a big boss, then I would be able to access the, all of the functional business rules in the company and, uh, and change them. I'm recognized as uh, not, a, uh, not quite uh, senior enough. If I were a little bit of a, of a lesser boss, sorry, just a second, I might have been able to edit all the macro system business rules. That too is not. I can choose from among the territories that the company has, a specific territory. And at this level, this is again using the sequence permissions uh, module that everybody's familiar with. <coughs> I know who the user is on the form. And I'll allow access to a specific branch of the business rules over here using the sequence, uh, the sequence business module. I have where I, uh, where I got to. You'll notice the cool graphics. They become uh, colored in uh, color blue. And I can move uh, onwards to, to where the actual uh, business rules are listed. What I'm looking at over here, I sh uh, should explain, um, is this is a standard grid view. Anybody that's developed uh, sequence workflows is familiar with it. But whereas Normally, this would be the result of a, some a items added or a, a standard query. This is actually a, an SQL view that's looking at business rules, the real business rules in sequence. Or more precisely, these aren't the entire business rules, parameters inside the business rules. And I'll explain in a second. The source of it is, as I said, in a, an SQL view. And what it takes back is parameters inside the business rule. So if, suppose if we look at um, the first one, uh, each of these, some of these will actually be relevant, and I'll go over them. This is a theoretical one. The maximum category A purchase price. What I'm saying over here is this. This is a parameter inside a workflow that's relevant to purchasing. It's relevant to, to the workflows that belong to these teams. And currently it's 25 euros, meaning what? If I if I have an item to be purchased up to and including 25 euros, then it will go down uh, the simple path, uh, what we call the, the quick uh, the, uh, approval path. If it's more than 25 euros, then it will go down the special approval path. The boss has to, has to approve it, etc., etc. But that number isn't, isn't in stone. 25 euros is what it costs now. The, prices might, might, uh, the average prices might go down. They might go up. And tomorrow it might be something different. So whereas normally you might have you might make a whole procedure of uh, enlisting the help of the IT, finding the business rule, locating the exact parameter inside the business rule, and then spending a great deal of time in this, and this would be something you do less of, less often because of that. The the manager in charge of this uh, of this uh, area, this purchasing area, can say, okay, I'm aware of the fact that there's been a, a drop in prices. I can expect. Uh, to have uh, to be able to purchase the the same uh, category uh, less than uh, than twenty euros, so I'll say the the new part the new maximum uh, price is twenty euros, and we'll con and uh, and submit it. Before I submit the form, I just wanted to show we can we can filter this before I uh, start filling in stuff <coughs> by divisions. This, this grid doesn't necessarily have to be the last step with just six uh, business rules. You can have, uh, it's likely that you'll have a great many more uh, business, um, business rules available to you. So you can filter this, and th that's a separate uh, webinar, uh, with, based on any of the fields. So if I say I want to filter by, uh, by the division and take only the business rules that are relative, uh, uh, the divisions that are relative to the, to the executive group, I can filter it out and get back only the, the executive line. So if we filtered it out, might as, well, might as well save it already. I set the trade cap, some arbitrary value at 0 0.5057 now, and update it. You'll notice it's currently 0 0.49. I send it to 0 0.57. If I go back again, next time I or anybody else goes back again to, to update the, the values, 
go down, go down the same path that I did before. Sorry, wrong one. You can see that the trade cap is now 0 0.57, and the previous value, 0 0.49, was added to the history. And we'll get to that in a bit, uh, the, the explanation of that. Another important thing to, to notice is the level. Even over here, even within the business rules that I'm allowed to change, you might allocate a level to each of them. Meaning, the, the higher the number, the, the more likely, the, 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 wide, the more widespread the changes. So if I change the exchange rate, whatever, the allowed exchange rate between two currencies, that'll be something that's shared by the entire company. So do, making that change means when I look at that level, whatever, level 10, and I'll say to myself, ooh, that's something that's going to change, that's going to affect a great many people, and it'll, I'll see it in the list of the workflows and the divisions that it affects also, and I'll think, think really hard on what I'm doing over there to understand the, the ramifications of what I'm doing. As I said before, the history is made available to you. So when you're looking at, a, at, a, at changing a business rule, it's not just what it is right now and what you want it to be. You can get a pretty clear idea of, which, of, of the, the past uh, few changes, again, depending on how you design the workflow. And it's very important to get a trend over here, even if, on, if only a, a, a simple uh, visual trend. And you can develop it more. You can also set yourself, as you can see on the right, an icon which, with, with uh, whatever information that you'd like <coughs> that explains the deep details for the, the, the name of the, the business rule with a short explanation of, the, of its history and where it's located with a, a screenshot where it's located in the, uh, in the, in the particular workflow. Uh, it's very useful, uh, again, to un for understand the, the scope of everything. And lastly, the ability to log the changes, as you can see, and since you're doing this inside a, a regular workflow, as regular as they come, to send out verifications to people that did it, notifications to people that are affected, etc., is in some ways it's actually better than changing it through the administration. And it allows you a greater perspective. So we've covered uh, the central business rule policy. Of course, you can take, uh, you can take this uh, to, uh, to many different uh, you know, in all sorts of different ways, make use of this. And, sorry. And at this point, I'd like to uh, to ask if anybody has uh, questions. Let's see if there's anybody on the. Apologies, there seems to be an issue with the... I apologize, I apologize just a moment. If any, I will I will un, unmute uh, everyone. Um, Anybody has any questions? Please. Uh... No, you don't. We, right now, we, we don't have any uh, questions. Excellent. Okay. Um, let's continue then. Okay, so like we said, 
we we covered the, the the smart searching options you have in the the grid that allow you uh, that allow a, a easier view the assigning of hierarchies to rules and management access both what you can see and even when you do see it to understand the the ramifications of it the history that you can see and the change logging and the email verifications those are all the the upsides of uh, of uh, using a central bus a business rule policy the the centrality of it how much it affects how much you allow users to to change is of course entirely up to the sp a specific organization um, decision-based workflows. Uh, what are decision-based workflows? You could have a a, a, a business a business uh, decision that needs to be made. And it can, it, it, would, it would necessarily be, of course, when you're talking about decision-based workflows, they're essentially an entire workflow that's designed to uh, take in whatever information is required. And the answer is yes or no. The answer isn't a, a, a complicated chain of events. It's a simple decision, true or false. Um, it would be applicable when, uh, of course, it's a com complex decision. It's not a, a standard business rule that says if the, the expenses is greater than 5,000 and your rank is uh, whatever, then the business rule has to go one way and otherwise it has to go the other way. It's, uh, it would be a step above even, even the, the gateway activities. It's, uh, it, would, it would be a, it's up from a certain level of, com of complexity and more. The decision, of course, like anything we want to put into a workflow, has to be uh, has to be able to be modeled as a workflow, if only loosely, if only as a as even as a rating, as a ranking. <coughs> um, you would we would uh, take the make the effort of making this sort of a a proper decision based workflow um, for high volume usage and when you when we really need high speed results. And the reason for that, and that's the last one over here, is because this is a, a no breadcrumb solution, which means this is no touching the database. For better, meaning the performance is faster and it's, uh, it's capable of, a, of uh, processing a, 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 a whole new order of, order of magnitude of more workflows for any given time. And uh, for worse, meaning there is no there is no uh, trail of what information was was processed and uh, and why uh, and why the processing uh, was such. And uh, the way to go about this, the way to um, to create such a decision based workflow is like this. Uh, let's start with the with the scenario. I have mortgage application. Sorry, shouldn't have had, shouldn't have had this already here. This is the end result. I have my uh, my uh, mortgage application workflow over here, which has two options. Uh, for certain uh, scenarios, I want to put put the the applicant through a, the VIP branch, which has its own. It would be a business customers, etc. It would be quicker and less. Uh, then, then I would have the standard uh, branch of the workflow. It's applicable to anything. It's just an example that uh, that uh, I'm uh, familiar with at the moment. Um, in order to create that sort of um, uh, the sort of workflow, and we'll we'll go through the the workflow itself, what exactly it looks like in a bit, I need to execute that uh, my uh, uh, decision based workflow in a non standard way. Sequence when it executes workflows, by definition, stuff gets written to the database. You can't go around it. The way around the way to do it over here is to, uh, to say I'm going to execute. Uh, execute whatever needs uh, the, the entire workflow from beginning to end as um, from the outside outside of the standard uh, the standard uh, sequence execution uh, context and I'm going to do it like this um, we'll get to the details in a bit essentially I have uh, my own custom code over here 
Um, I already created, of course, the, the workflow before. And I have my own custom code over here uh, to, go, uh, to go through it. It's a bunch of, of uh, functions, and we'll go through them uh, in, the, in their order. The execute function is the only public function over here. And then we're going to take uh, the following steps. We're going to go over the high, medium level of the stuff. You have to create a, an instance or latch on to an instance of uh, the sequence engine. That's over here. Um, you have to create the workflow space object. Again, the parameters that are coming into here are like any external uh, external uh, application call. In other words, it's connected, but it's not entire, you're not passing real objects from sequence into there. And so we're passing the workflow name or ID, whatever. And from that, we have to create the workflow space um, object. Once we have that within the workflow space, we have to grab the workflow, uh, the, wor the active workflow template, because we know there can be several different versions of it. We have to then take the parameters that we got, that we received. If you noticed up on top of the beginning, the incoming uh, parameters required of the space name, the relationship with the bank, the, the applicant's nationality, and uh, the income and uh, the type of the property that we're buying. Property being a difficult word over here. In other words, the real estate property. We have the stuff over here. These are the parameters that uh, we're, we'll uh, be making use of inside the code. And for every time you run a, 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 you execute an activity, you need the expression context, and that's the the object that we're creating over here. I'm not sure if I said it before. All of this will be available as a separate download um, uh, after the webinar is done. And over here in the execute workflow, this is what the part that we're just going to to cover uh, theoretically. What we're doing is recursively diving into the workflow. It'll find the start. It, uh, that's all the information that we need. It finds the start activity and starts digging through the connections. Whatever goes to the start, after that, branching out and branching out. Each of the activities, uh, based on its type, is, uh, is uh, of course, it, a, a different overload. So you have the, the standard activity, the start, if else, and uh, assign. And for each one of them, while it's executing, it just checks if it's, uh, if it's not in an endless loop or anything like that. Each of these, again, if we go through the uh, go through them quickly, they're they're not more than than fifteen or twenty lines each of them. And while we're not going to go through all the details, they they essentially are. Um, this is the object. Take it, process it, uh, and uh, add, tell me who is uh, who follows you, and uh, call the redirect method so that you can uh, you can get uh, through it. Recursively, once with the once the the objects all reach a uh, blocked or we reach the end activity, um, the workflow will return with a, this is a built-in uh, built-in parameter called the return value uh, variable. It has to be defined in our workflow, but it, it doesn't it, no uh, manual intervention uh, before that. And using this uh, return value, this is what we return. Uh, Backward, back upwards. Now this is a boolean. True or false? What happens exactly will happen inside the workflow. We'll have a look at a second after any questions. If anybody has any questions, please uh, use the the questions or chat uh, chat boxes, um, and I'll, I will try to to assist. We'll take two seconds. Uh, we'll take a moment to see if anybody's typing any questions, and then uh, we will continue. Just the one question then. The using using a an external uh, service like this, uh, which is behaving, in other words, using a, a DLL which is behaving as a business rule. Yes, visually it can be. Uh, it's uh, it's not ideal. I agree, and I hope that uh, we'll have a a 
have this more easily incorporated in some uh, future version. I can't, uh, I can't know right now when. Um, so as we said, we took this code and we ran through it and we uh, and we we treated our our uh, this, our DLL essentially calling a workflow and in using it as a business rule. Let's have a quick look at what uh, what that uh, that workflow is. This is essentially what it looks like, and without again, this is just my arbitrary business, uh, workflow creation. The the limitations on it, you can see the type of activities right right away is uh, limited. It's uh, limited to the if else the business rule, the gateway activities, the split, join, and switch, and to assign activities. Using those. And of course, the the parameters that we saw before in the function, you go in uh, to any one of these uh, into any one of these uh, junctions, and you start um, you start uh, processing them. It's as simple as taking the parameter that came in, the nationality in this case, and splitting it up. There's a European territory, there's a USA territory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The visualization that you get over here. It's so much easier than if you have a a, a mile long business rule uh, that that only whoever wrote it uh, understands, and that that even uh, only for a certain amount of time. So we have this this uh, uh, this workflow over here, and it's uh, and it's meant to run as a, as a de as a decision based workflow. Let's have a look how to implement it. So we saw the code, and now that we saw the the workflow itself, let's have a look how to implement it and uh, put a put uh, one or two workflows through. We have the mortgage application. This is a non-standard uh, junction. So let's see how to uh, put it in. Sorry, wrong one. Take an external service um, consumer, and yes, the the at least the name. Can be can be clear. Check if the, the person that's uh, applying should be should go down the VIP path, or should go down uh, the other. When you're calling the, uh, the that sort of code, you need of course the the assembly's full name. We we did this before in one of the one of the sessions. Uh, how to find it? You can use uh, the, a reflector, and in this case, I. Uh, already set it aside. It's essentially the name of the the class, the version, the culture, and the the public key. If anybody has any questions about this, again, I'm glad to help offline. And the sequence can dig into the into the global assembly cache, and it can see the the publicly available uh, uh, functions. They're the standards, the the two string, etc., and the the one that we're going to use, the execute, which accepts uh, the, the the values. You have to choose the correct uh, method, the correct function, and when we do, we can see the uh, the parameters that we need the, to send it. This is like any WCF or web service call. Um, the mortgage application form holds all the information that we need, and this would be this workflow space name is is. Uh, a bit of a just a default value on the form that's hidden over there, and each of these that we want that uh, we want to add, we validate and we accept. Taking them all from uh, the mortgage application form. These can also be already uh, calculated values. So you'll have, when you consider the the income that you want to you want to uh, show, then it would be both the the applicant's income and the partner income. They would of course both have to be integer fields for that to work. And the property type, again, a little bit of a misleading name. It's meant to be the real estate property type. So this external service consumer that I, uh, that I created over here, 
is functioning as as the predecessor to a to a business rule. Whatever it returns, based on whatever it returns, a, this a standard business rule will then take that value and just uh, blindly redirect uh, left to right to VIP or to the standard. Check if VIP return value is true. It goes there. The other way, otherwise, it goes the other way. The logic is all happening inside over here. That didn't work very well. All right, computer seems to be a little bit stuck now. Just a moment, I'm going to refresh the uh, Explorer window. Just a second, please. Finally. Okay. Um, we added a new activity over here, so we should uh, reapply the permissions. This is uh, the quick and dirty way to do it. And before we continue, let's make sure that, it's, uh, that it all validates. Let's put a test workflow through. So the way through this is like this. There are two parameters that eventually that will um, that will allocate you VIP status, either a previous relationship with the bank or a, a, your annual income. I will demonstrate to you um, actually three things. First of all, the the using the the relationship, then the uh, the income, and then. We'll loop back quickly to the beginning to the central business rule management, and we'll see how the how you can use that also in a thing like in a situation like this. So we auto populated the form because that's just because I'm lazy, and we will demonstrate the two the two extremes. If my previous relationship code, and again this would be something that would be an auto populated uh, field, a hidden auto populated field, is AA3, meaning I'm previously recognized as a, a as a VIP customer, and it doesn't matter how much my income is. It can be a dollar. It could be anything. And I put the work, push the workflow through over here. We can see that uh, my uh, my VIP status was approved, and it's true, and it's all fine. Um, the other way to do it 
is via income. First, I can show you actually the no result. If my re relationship is anything and the annual income isn't quite enough, then I will go, will have gone down uh, the standard route over here. Failed, didn't have the, the required the criteria, and gone, the, gone down the standard route. And lastly, if I do the, use uh, the other way, I can have a relationship of uh, whatever. As long as it's uh, more than more than the limit, which I think I set to a hundred thousand, it will go down uh, the VIP path uh, over there. Um, before we continue on to the next subject, if we just have a quick loop back to the beginning. Added to the list of business rules that I can manage uh, this particular uh, parameter. If we look at it, the minimum VIP income uh, was 130,000. Meaning, if um, if I have a, if I if I had a make more than 130,000, then I'm in the VIP. If not, then the other way around. I can change it to any value that I uh, that I please. I can set the minimum VIP income uh, to five five dollars a year, and if I update this over here, the business rule has been uh, accepted. Of course, in real life, you would have verifications and and uh, etc. as necessary, email notifications that go out to everybody. If I go back now uh, to here. And I keep the, the relationship uh, as V. And I say that between uh, myself and my partner, I make $6. Then I've gone, the, this rule changed, and I'm now a, a part of the, the VIP uh, path, as it was uh, before. Um, are there any questions, please? If you could uh, type them through the, the chat or the, the, the questions window in the, in the GoToWebinar, please. Okay, just the one. I don't think you can you can do this nested um, decision-based workflows because, as we said, the sub the subflow activity is not uh, is none of the the supported list right now. Of course, these uh, things, if there's a particular need involved, then uh, I would I'll be more than happy if uh, if you uh, contact me. Um, if we continue over here. The, the third and last subject of today is matrix-based workflows. Very cool name, but it's just about running the same workflow from different uh, axes, from different uh, divisions, and using different uh, internal parameters. Um, I suppose we should start with the, with the demonstration before we, uh, before we go on through over here. If we look at the expense approvals work, uh, wor uh, workflow, this is an oversimplified again uh, workflow. Uh, from from the, uh, anybody knows it. You have you go to, you on a business trip. You ate in a restaurant. You slept in a hotel, and you submit uh, your expenses. 
Uh, typically, if you work, if you're, if you're, if you're not uh, employing matrix-based workflows, then if you have different logic uh, for for your workflow, then you might have several different workflows. You'd have one for the executives with a, a certain a limit on on the, uh, expenses, and a separate one for the, for uh, more junior workers. A separate one for sales, which have uh, you know, their own branch of uh, of uh, who gets who gets uh, billed for what, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What matrix-based workflows are about are saying dispense with the extra workflows and if you can figure out if you can we'll, uh, we'll elaborate a little bit on the theory of that uh, how to loosely couple your workflows passing a minimum minimal amount of information between them and instead take the vital information and within the workflow itself uh, collect what you need in other words if in this case you're an employee then what's your rank what uh, division you belong to etc cetera, etc cetera. and based on that make your changes inside the workflow in in this case, what we're doing is we'll cover it uh, in a bit. We have we'll uh, we'll uh, crawl through this workflow like we did uh, before. You have the details, the the initial uh, uh, form that's filled out. Uh, the in, within the workflow itself, using the assign activity and sequence expressions, um, we grab the the user's group affiliation. Once we have the group affiliation. We have that ID. Then we can we can grab the group maximum uh, expense. Again, this is overly simplified. It's a single category, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The group's max maximum expense, or you can even return an entire array, different categories and different maximums. And based on that, the information is now inside the inside that. Based on that, we can uh, we have a business rule that doesn't uh, that doesn't need uh, to go about looking uh, you know in all sorts of different places. All it's uh, it's going about is uh, using taking that return value and uh, directing the workflow accordingly the business rule can be more or less complicated depending on what needs to be what needs to be done over here of course um, the rules over here again the maximums over here that are allowed if we look back again I'm not going to go through it again but they're also they're also included over there in the um, in the central business rule management uh, interface uh, so this this too eventually essentially can be uh, can be managed uh, from a, a single place and you can see how they're all intertwined with each other central business rule management allowing you to mo to modify the business parameters bringing them f uh, to the foreground and making them transparent and in the background doing the complicated stuff over here in the in the decision based and the matrix based uh, workflows so you have over here in the details form our overly simplified form. This is the information that we uh, that we need to accept. I did it on. I, I made it a simple form to emphasize uh, the point. This workflow can be a, can be a human interface workflow, meaning somebody will fill out these uh, these mi the minor details, and it of course as a matrix-based workflow, I'll explain later, can be called from all sorts of different places as a subflow. So if I have a, a, a workflow that's responsible for booking hotels and afterwards, uh, when at the end of the trip, uh, rating them so that the company understands uh, the, the quality of them, then it, some of it might be called this as a subflow. Oh, you went to a hotel? I'll open this up for you and I already have your name and the dates and everything. And it'll be, uh, it'll be an automated uh, expense workflow as well. I choose all I have to supply uh, supply for it is uh, my name and the daily expense, whatever it is, and we'll keep a constant uh, sum. We'll say a sum of uh, of a thousand dollars, a thousand euros, for car rental. Alice Farley is a member of the executive group. She has a greater, uh, greater maximum, and so the the workflow uh, is uh, is redirected to the automated approval. Quick, no uh, no no manual intervention required. <clears throat> On the other hand, if I use the same the same workflow again, the the essential information is grabbed over here. What group do you belong to, and what's your maximum? These are all uh, workflow variables that are loaded up with their information using uh, sequence expressions. If I do the same thing as uh, as somebody else, 
all things remain the same. The same expense, uh, if William Oliver would incur the same, uh, same expense on the same day for the same category, William's um, limit is lower than a thousand dollars. William's limit is five hundred is euros again. Sorry, is uh, five hundred euros. So this sort of uh, this sort of uh, uh, over the top uh, expense will go on to the manager's approval. A different a different branch. The same workflow shared by different divisions. The executive, the whatever the the support, whatever groups that are involved over here, and. Since the logic all happens inside, um, it can uh, it can uh, co they can coexist with each other. So if we go if we hop on back to uh, uh, the slide for the theory of it, you have the same expense approval workflow that we had uh, before, shared by the different uh, divisions or uh, whatever the, the group entities inside the company. Each of the divisions can call this from different angles. In other words, uh, the, the executive would have it as a standard uh, direct human access because there are more expenses. Uh, the sales would have it as part of the, the, the greater workflow of traveling uh, salespeople around, etc., etc. And of course, the, the direct uh, manual access for anybody, depending on the scenario. You couple that in with the, 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 the four or five parameters that, uh, that are required, keep it to a minimum, and then uh, the, work, and the information is, is processed inside the same way. If you can share that, you have a, you have a, a much better uh, control over the, the workflow design. Um, so to, to recap and to cover up the, 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 the items that we didn't already cover, the matrix-based workflows are useful uh, like, um, in, in, as a sense to, to be a framework to applications you already have. You might have uh, the interface could be automated, like a web, uh, web service consumers and listeners or SQL uh, listeners of different kinds. And if, you, if you're careful to, to manage for the non-transactional applications, especially databases, the old legacy systems, you understand how they work, you can use sequence as a framework. If you already have a, have a solution, you paid money and you invested effort into implementing, you can use sequence to chain that in, to link that into everything, to the other information and to, and to reporting, etc. You can use it to reuse existing sequence workflows. You already designed the workflow. You have it all in place. It's working, it's running, and it's humming. You can rethink it and say, okay, this workflow, I can, I'm, uh, I can share it with, uh, with a different division with only minimal changes on the, on the inside, inside the workflow logic, and recycle the, the, the workflow, reuse the workflow instead of uh, starting it all over again, and then later managing and, and editing and, and uh, testing uh, extra workflows that are almost, uh, almost exactly, uh, almost uh, identical to each other. And Lastly, the, the important thing is when you're looking at each of these workflows and you're tempted to, to, to define it as a matrix-based workflow, you have to dis, uh, define this as an academic, uh, only you can only read this in academic uh, articles, the execution atomicity of the workflows that you're talking about. Meaning, if you have a tiny workflow that's meant to calculate the, uh, the, the exchange rate between two different uh, currencies, then of course the atomicity of this uh, of this workflow is is nearly nearly zero. In other words, it doesn't have a life unto itself. Nobody will open up a workflow in sequence to calculate the uh, to calculate the the currency. It's meant to work exclusively as uh, as a, a, a dependent workflow, and as such, you have to consider much. More, uh, you have to consider carefully and look through the documentation. Who has a stake in this workflow? Who will be affected if I make any changes over here? It be it a, a small visual or a minor logical change inside the workflow, which is relatively easy, or at worst a, a change to the parameters, the incoming or outgoing parameters, which would almost certainly um, affect everybody that's uh, that's interfacing with it. Um, the the last consideration that you want, and uh, for those of you that are familiar with the with the term from .NET programming, loosely coupled systems, is the attitude that you uh, that you should be uh, should be adopting over here. 
uh, the design should be loosely coupled uh, between any workflow that might interact with each other. Um, you should think, as we did before with the expense approval, it's a simple, small uh, five, uh, five control form that can be filled out manually. And because it's, uh, it's a relatively uh, a small uh, interface, it has, you have the option of calling it as a, sub, as a subflow from a variety of different places. Um, and most importantly, because that's the, the underpinning of everything that we spoke of today, you need to document the workflows. You need to document the, the, the atom workflows, the small ones and the bigger ones, uh, so that anybody that's, uh, that, uh, that has the, the thought of, uh, of changing them uh, should have a, a clear idea of who is who's involved and what the, what the stakes are. So, like we said, managing a central business rule policy lays down the foundation for the matrix-based shared workflows. And those they share workflows, so they should share their administration um, with the with the central business rule administration. The classic workflows to share, like we said, are the decision-based workflows because everybody needs them. And as you see, they interweave with each other the ideas uh, and and uh, the concepts, creating this uh, general subject of advanced business rule management. Um, thank you very much for listening. If anybody has any questions, I'll uh, be online for, for another few minutes. And this workflow will be available for download uh, uh, tomorrow, towards the end of the business day. Thank you very much.